I'm an Australian. I did art in high school. I then mostly just thought about art every day of my life until I was 50. And what happened was my eldest daughter, when she finished art in high school, her final project got into the State Gallery exhibition and she won a scholarship to a very old art school in Sydney. And I was crazy jealous. I was really pleased for her as her dad. But it made me think, man, I, I wish I could do that. I wish I had that chance. And the strength of my feeling made me think, look, if it's that important, do something about it. Don't complain. Maybe you're busy with life and family, but you can do something. And if you don't make the time and effort, nobody else will. That was my wake-up call. And so I just did like at a technical college, a three-hour introduction drawing course on the way home. My wife was very supportive. And yes, it worked. It was three hours a week, every week where I drew. And I didn't do any other drawing, but it made me realise how much I really wanted to do it. And the next year, I did the three-hour painting course. It was a wide range of subjects, of medium, as an introductory course should. And, and, and it approaches techniques. Uh, we did a lot of wide things. And so I, I feel like I had a sense of what I wanted to paint, which was things like what's behind me, this big tree canopy, Australian eucalyptus tree. I began to paint and do these things that I'd had in my head. And then seven years ago, I had the chance to be paid for leaving work. Uh, it's called the Voluntary Redundancy here in Australia. Yeah. And they want to shrink workforce and they pay you sometimes good money to leave. I thought, yeah, that's me. And I've been working full time for seven years. And, but I was just painting. I did all stuff like this and uh, lots of flowers because it was easier to sell the flowers because they were colourful and pretty. But I really enjoyed doing the big trees more myself. And then we went to Europe for a family holiday. We were, my children were all adults and we all came together in Paris. We were walking back to our Airbnb on one of our last nights and I said to my youngest daughter, who was doing a fine arts degree. Why don't we just stop and draw Notre Dame? It looks so beautiful. It's just here to where we're staying. And she said, oh, that'd be wonderful. Besides being a wonderful experience with my daughter, just sit in front of this beautiful, famous medieval building on the other side of the world. The drawing actually turned out quite well. And the crazy thing is she said, oh, post that on your Instagram account, Dad. Because I started an Instagram account because the kids said, um, oh, you're an artist now, you have to have one. So they set it up for me. If I got 20 likes, I got excited. I had about 300 followers and, and I felt like I was playing games with social media and being an artist in, in, in lots of ways. And I said to my youngest, I said, look, it's, it's just a drawing. It's not a real artwork. And she said, don't be silly, Dad. Of course it's an artwork. Drawing's artwork, you know. And, and so we posted it. and it got a really good reception because what I didn't realise was there's a huge world out there that loves drawing either architecture or streetscapes. I connected with people who hadn't seen my work before. The response on Instagram just blew my mind. Like it just was crazy. People talk about social media and trolls and the negativity of it. Personally, I found it such an encouraging experience Maybe I'm in an age where, you know, I, I can connect more easily with a gentler audience, but it's just been this tremendous experience. And, and I found that I was wanting to make sure I had something to post because I knew that there were people who enjoyed seeing what I did. When you're an artist and you work alone in a studio, often you're just by yourself and you, you can paint and paint for six months and almost no one sees the work except your wife or your kids. And they have to say, oh, that's nice. They see it get created bit by bit. So often there's certainly no surprise at the end and, and you lose that element of, oh, this is great or, oh, I didn't expect this. So to suddenly be able to get that daily was amazing. I thought of painting every day of my life for, for, for say, from 20 to 50 and didn't do it. There are reasons why you're not doing it. I had to overcome all those and certainly the encouragement I got from the the people who often very enthusiastically liked my work was actually a help in, in pushing through some of those barriers. Despite feeling um, as if I'm the oldest man on social media, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, been, it's been a wonderful experience. And of course, I've met other artists now. I know about 15 Parisian photographers who are very happy for me to use their photos as references. Of course, I always credit and I advertise their course that often they make my drawing as one of their stories on, on their account, which is lovely. It's lovely to have that collaborative effort. I did the artwork for a board game 
for um, a Swiss lady, a graduate from the Juilliard in New York, a violin, and she's played all over Europe. She wanted to do a Phantom of the Opera board game to go with her concert presentation of the music of the period of Phantom of the Opera. She's an amazing. And she'd seen my drawings on Instagram. And so I got to collaborate with her and, and do this thing that really pushed me. She kept asking, oh, could you do this? Could you do that? No, I don't draw that. Oh, I think you could try, you know, and, and it all worked out beautifully. And so it's, it's with this person on the other side of the world who I've never met to connect and to explore some sort of collaborative journey and to come up with something great. Unfortunately, the game's in French. So she sent me some copies, but I'm not able to play it, but I am able to look at it and enjoy the fact that I contributed to this. Again, it's an experience that I never thought I would have had in my life. I think it's a, a beautiful story. I just kept thinking with all the family support, your daughter who helped you set up Instagram and you experiencing all these amazing things that social media provide. This is, wow, this is such a beautiful story. One of the things that happened was class 101 approaching. Oh, yes. And I had been a school teacher. And I've always liked explaining things. And I was thinking, like, what more can I do with this? And, and particularly as I invested more time and effort into my social media account, I was thinking, well, this is what I do full time. You know, can I make some money in doing some things with social media? And so I thought, well, why not give it a go? It's one thing to draw. It's another thing to have to be on camera and to video. My youngest daughter said, I'll come and video dad. I want to develop those skills more. And so I said, yeah, that's great. All right, we'll do that. When you were creating the course, were you already uploading videos on YouTube? So no, was, no, oh. I'd never done anything before. I don't think I would have been able to do jump to YouTube if I hadn't had class 101. And another reason why I did the class 101, because I thought, look, this really is the future. I could see that everyone under my age was doing things online. So I thought I really should, and, and I do feel in many ways I'm a reasonably good mm -hmm. teacher. So mm -hmm. I thought I, I need to learn this, but I know myself and I will never get around to doing it myself. And I thought if I sign a contract with someone, I have to do it. There you go. Which is also a good discipline for my daughter as well. So yeah. <laughs> And I couldn't be doing the YouTube videos now without the confidence I got doing the Class 101 videos. It's, it's all been part of my personal journey. Of course, now, even with Instagram, you have to do so many videos now. It's really funny. You look at your, step, your analytics on Instagram and suddenly everything drops in a straight line to zero. Oh, the algorithm's changed again. I need mm -hmm. to do something because I'm doing exactly the same thing I've always done. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I've got to... Either not worry about it or I've got to respond. But certainly, yeah, we all need to learn how to make videos if mm -hmm. we really have an online presence. What do you like the most about engaging with your followers on social media? You touched on it a little bit. I was mesmerized to hear about your creative collaborations that can only happen in the social media world. But what do you like the most about engaging with your followers more on a day-to-day -day basis? Part of me is just still astounded that I can talk to the world from Australia at no charge. Like, you know, I remember when talking with people, even within Australia, who didn't live close, was very expensive and very difficult to set up. I, I give drawing lessons to people. I can talk in real time. I can see what they're drawing. They email me their drawings. I print them off. I put them on camera and I critique them. It's incredibly easy. I'm astounded at how straightforward connecting with people in this way on the other side of the world can be. In Australia, we do feel very far from everyone else. Besides that, what's really amazed me is how generous people are in their comments, how kind, generous and affirming. That's not something I suppose I've always felt about my work, which is probably why I had 30 years to do it. I have had so many, like hundreds if not thousands of people say that they've been inspired to draw or to start drawing again by looking at my work. And because I struggled for so many decades of my life not drawing, if my work now can actually inspire people to get over their things, to make them think, I would just love to do this too. And I'm going to make it happen for me. I'm, I, I have such enjoyment from looking at this work that I want to give it a go because I'm inspired to think I, I can get there. I can do that. I want to engage in that process. I just get endless comments about that. And I never expected any of this. That's such a strong message, what you're putting out there in the world. It'd be hard look, not to react to that. <laughs> this is partly why I'm doing the YouTube. I really enjoyed doing the 
Class 101. And if I can just say a little ad, the good thing about my Class 101 course is it's 30 videos and you, you step through in, in, in my mind what's the logical sequence of skill development, of concepts, of practice, of smaller focus in each lesson that I think builds nicely in developing technique and style and confidence. And whereas with my YouTube videos, each one is separate, but you don't necessarily know the best way to engage with each of them for you. But when I did the class for my mom, for many people in many countries, their local economy will never allow them to buy anything in US dollars. It's just the way some countries' economies, their exchange rate is so low in comparison that they just can't earn enough to pay for any course on any platform. And yet drawing is a really accessible art form because you only need pencil and paper. And so people who don't have opportunity maybe to do big oil paintings on canvases with expensive paints, they can draw and there's subject matter to draw all around us. Lots of people without any other opportunity for creating processes because they can never afford supplies or access them easily, they draw. And I began to be aware of that when I looked at where my followers came from and the ages that they were, some of them would write to me. I began to realise that a lot of them were quite young and were in quite remote places. And like I live in a city, the city's got, I don't know, five or six million people in a very big city. So I wanted to do something that could help them. And, and the incredible thing I've learned is with my YouTube videos, I've got universities in developing nations in their schools of architecture who actually use my YouTube drawing courses because it's free and they don't have the resources. And I'm so happy about that. These people will never be my customers or class 101's class customers because they can't afford to engage with a platform, any platform, not yours or anyone in US dollars. And so I really like the idea that I can make art and some of my experience and skills accessible. I have so much living where I live that has not come to me through any hard work on in my part. It's just the luck of it. And I just think it's amazing that this unexpected blessing in my life, bonus stuff, and this art that has been so much more successful in terms of the drawings I've been able to do that other people can not just enjoy but benefit from what I've learned because I've really only been drawing for four years. What do you think is the most important thing about drawing? Look, I actually think it's not drawing, it's observing. The biggest problem is we don't look carefully enough to see the things we need to see to draw this accurately. And that's assuming, of course, that I want to draw an accurate representation. If I'm deliberately distorting it or I'm creating from my imagination, and it, then that's different again. And that's great. That can look amazing. But if I'm trying to draw a realistic copy of something that's in a photo or that I'm seeing in life. The biggest problem people have is not that they lack drawing skills, it's that they lack observation skills. And I see it in myself first, despite the fact that I bang this drum all the time with drawing students and on, I still see it in myself where I go to draw the line and I think, ah, oh, I just don't know how far it goes. I didn't look to see how far it goes and compare it, the alignment with somewhere else. And I think, do I have to look back at the reference or can I just draw it? And the fact that I'm even tempted to draw it, having admitted to myself that I don't actually know where to end the line to be accurate, shows that I still haven't quite got past that. We draw what we think we've seen. And sometimes that's just poor observation, but sometimes we create mental pictures. So say so trees, people often overdraw the leaves because they think they've seen those leaves because the brain knows they're there. But you don't actually see them. That's where they're drawing what they think they've seen, not what they're... It's why I'm... I don't do portraits myself, but I do look at... I enjoy looking at art and drawings. And with a lot of drawing portraits, often the features look great, but the proportions of the outside of the face aren't correct. They often haven't left enough space, especially the forehead and the chin, because... We don't look at those parts as closely as we look at the features because these are more important to us. And we think we know, oh, yeah, that's a forehead. And I don't really look to see it. The same with the side on. The back of the head goes back much further than most people draw. But again, it's not really important to us in day-to-day -day life. So we think we know how far back it goes, but we don't actually look closely at our reference to think, wow, it actually goes back twice as far as from here to here or, or whatever. And that's what I'm talking about. The good news is that 
people can probably draw better than they think, but they don't observe. You can't draw what you haven't seen. And so invest in more time in observing. Carpenters in Australia have a saying, measure twice, cut once. It applies to drawing too, especially when you draw directly in ink, as I've started doing that, because once you put that line down, you can't erase it. I think it also goes back to drawing effects as opposed to drawing the real thing. It only comes after having observed the thing. I know you're going to say no, but I'm going to ask this anyway. Are there any shortcuts to drawing details? Look, I suppose when I talk about drawing the effect, that is a shortcut because you're not drawing all the details. And I often get comments on Instagram with people saying, I was just blown away by your detail. But when I zoomed in to look at it better, it wasn't there. Like you hadn't really drawn it. You sort of tricked me. So when you look at it overall, you feel the detail. I've drawn just enough that I tricked the brain into seeing it where I haven't actually drawn it because that's what happens in life. If I go into the Paris Opera House, I, I will look at one part in detail. But all the peripheral vision around that I see, I get a feeling of the detail, but I don't actually focus on one small part of detail. I do a fairly accurate detail section somewhere. When you look at my drawing and you will zoom in on that detail because detail attracts attention and it'll be clearer and with stronger contrast because I'll do that in that section. And all the parts around that, that I haven't put the same detail in, that mimics real life where you focus on one thing and you just get a sense of what's around. And so it creates the feeling of reality because that's what happens in real life. When I look at a building, I don't see every brick with the same detail and clarity all at once. I only see the detail of a smaller section of bricks. And if you draw every brick, then to me, it looks something artificial. It doesn't look as real as if I just drawn more of the bricks in the focal point and just suggested the brick working other parts. So okay. does that make sense? It was a really good point when you said, when I looked at a building, I don't see all the bricks. Mm. I guess it depends on what you're drawing, which building you're drawing and what the yeah. strongest features are of the building. How do you decide which details to focus on? It partly depends. Detail is another way that you use to create a uh, depth or, or distance. One of the things that characterizes my drawing is that I create this really strong sense of depth, the distance in my drawings, whether it's an interior scene of a large interior space or whether we're looking down the street. And one of the ways you create a sense of depth is by reducing, there's a number of ways, but one of them is by reducing the detail as you go further back again, because in life, if I look down a street, say a row of shops, one street that the buildings are close together and I can see a lot of things at once. I see a lot more detail with the closest ones. And I also see things more brightly, more strongly and more clearly. And so what I'm trying to do is to draw that effect in my drawing. So I often use a wider pen, maybe a five millimeter fine line close. And then for the mid ground, I might go to a 0.3 and further back at a 0.1 and maybe even a 0.05. That helps get the sense of things going further away because you don't see them as clearly. With colour, bright colours come forward and duller colours go back. In the distance, some colours drop out of the visible spectrum over distance and, and so those colours fade. So the yellows fade. So mountains in the distance look blue because they're green because of the trees. But because the yellow doesn't travel as far through the atmosphere, we start to see more blue because green is yellow and blue. Similarly, the, the, the shadows further away are lighter, even though they're as dark as what's in front, but we perceive them as being lighter as they go back. And so I seek to replicate all of those phenomena in my drawing using my tools, which are line thickness, line strength, cross-hatching, learning to be restrained, especially early in a drawing is really important. And I invariably draw the closest things first for a number of reasons. But one of them is if I make those my strongest area for detail, for line, for tone, then it lets me work, at, work out as I go back, how light do I need to make it 
Whereas if I start further back, I may make them too dark or too detailed and then I've got nowhere to go when I come forward because I've already committed and, you know, I don't want to have three, you know, I don't want to have thick lines at the front. So it's, mm -hmm. it's also subtle that you're employing these tricks. Who would you recommend this course to? I would recommend it to someone who loves architecture and streetscapes generally who wants to develop a style where they can create fairly realistic scenes, where they want things to be technically correct. So they want the perspective to be correct. They want to learn to create a three-dimensional surface and to avoid their building something a bit cartoony, which again can happen if you don't create a strong sense of three dimension with your windows. We don't have to draw the three-dimensionality of the details over the whole thing. If we do it in the closer parts, the brain will see it where we haven't drawn it further back, where there isn't room to draw it and you don't notice it in life so much. But if we draw it where the brain expects to see it, it will fill it in in all the other places. It's a lot of like magicians and sleight of hand and get someone to look here and they don't really see what's happening over there. <laughs> do you have any upcoming events or projects you'd like to share? I don't really because I don't really know what I'm doing still. I'm just bumbling on, drawing. I deliberately chose to put a lot of time into YouTube and YouTube videos and I've done that. And I'm now trying, and while I was doing that, Instagram changed their algorithm about four times. And I'm trying to work out what my photo, and also I've developed a different drawing style with the videos because I do a lot of direct drawing now pen directly on paper and I, I really enjoy that because one of my things is practice what you want to get better at and the thing I learned is that mistakes never look as bad as the moment you make it that's the worst it will ever look I've learned that no mistake is as bad at the end as, as you just made it and you think no I ruined it no look. and I make so many mistakes I, I do have a video as part of the video I um and about four or five drawings where I made mistakes. I thought it was a disaster, but I did this and this. And look at this one. This line's in the wrong place. It's obvious now, you know, and, and there's one where I couldn't hide it. it. I put the top of the dome too high. But you just don't notice it. I bet no one saw it before I pointed it out. But at the time, I thought, oh, good grief. I spent hours on this, and now I've wrecked it with this line that I can't, with this curve that's just higher than it should be. It's when not. you're immersed in the work, it's really hard to put things into perspective. I mean, basically yeah. everything I say is one, two or three videos I've made. <laughs> so it sounds a bit like I have a script for everything. <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's because I do. Yeah, you've been actively creating content, which is awesome. Well, it was really funny after I did the Class 101 thing, videos and editing and all of that. And I just, I finished that, it was done, it was posted off and I just went back to drawing. I couldn't believe that all the time I was hearing my teaching voice in my head saying the things that I'd said on camera for the various videos. I was like teaching myself as I was drawing now. It was like I was watching my own videos and I could hear my voice as a teacher saying, now make sure you do this as I was doing that, like whatever was relevant to the drawing I was doing, yeah, I could hear the echo of my voice teaching about that thing. It was really crazy. Yeah. You had to, you were destined to be on YouTube. You couldn't go back <laughs> after our course. It's amazing to hear. Is there um, anything you'd like to add to this interview? Two things. Firstly, hey, if you've got the money, please do my course. I, I really think there's a lot of value. I've got 160 or 70 YouTube videos, but there is a lot to be said for a structured course where where you go methodically from one area to another and you get to build on skills and experience even within that course. So don't think, oh, I, there's no benefit. I'll just look at these YouTube videos. Uh, there is benefit in the post, but there is a lot of benefit in doing a course rather than just a lot of loss. It lets me build a focus and momentum with the skills that we're doing and refer back and to pull things in with what you're doing later. It's stronger for skill and technique development to do a planned series of lessons. The other thing is if you want to learn to draw your own drawings, don't copy other people's drawings. And this maybe is perhaps one of the more controversial things I say, but that's because 
copying other people's drawings won't give you any practice at all in the skill you need to draw your own. I think of drawing as if it's translation work, whether it's in front of us as a three-dimensional object and I have to translate it onto a two-dimensional sheet of paper using a pen. Or even if I see uh, a photo, which is already two dimensions, which is why it's easier to copy from a photo than from real life, because the photo has already done the three dimensions into two dimensions, but a photo has all this incredible detail that I can't copy. And so I have to work out how I translate this massive detail and tone and shade and whatever using a pen onto a sheet of paper. Now that translation work is actually a massive creative process. It's the hardest part of doing a drawing. Observation is part of that, which is why I say observation is so much more important than what people think. But you've still got to work out how do I create this effect? Now, if you copy my drawing, all you have to do is copy the lines that I've drawn. I've wrestled with how do I kind of represent this this funny shade, funny edge in with these lines, dots, cross hatching, mm -hmm. whatever. You don't have to work any of that out. You can copy what I've done, which is easier. People are often attracted to drawing copies of other people's drawings mm -hmm. because it gives them a better drawing at the end. And it's always it's great to have a good drawing. And so I get that. And that's fine if if you're if just draw it, copying other people's drawings is makes you happy and you want to do it but if you want to develop the skills to be able to do your own drawing then that won't take you there because it doesn't give you practice in the creative processes you need to be able to do it you want your students to do the heavy lifting because it's the element yeah. of developing your own style and if that's what you good, want yeah being a good artist yes because i want to be able to sit in the string have a copy and sketch something that really excites them. And, and you don't get that by copying my drawings or anyone's drawings. I don't mind if people copy my drawings. In my class 101 course, every single lesson I say, do not draw along and do not copy my drawing at the end. And I very rarely ask anyone to draw what I've drawn. I give something similar to draw so there can be some inspiration from what I've drawn. But I say, do not copy because you don't want to learn to copy. You want to learn to do your own drawings and you have to have the self-control to stay developing the skills that will put you in that place.